Today is May 26, 2023. Beautiful day here in San Marcos, Texas, about 85, maybe close to 90 degrees. About one o'clock in the afternoon, we're here at the airport doing a bunch of work, taking care of some stuff with airplanes. And I have got to say, I am not tremendously happy with myself in terms of the consistency and cadence of YouTube videos that I've been putting out on the channel. What does it say? Airplane single engine land, airplane single engine sea, airplane multi-engine land. That's the newest addition. Multi-engine commercial. I'm Josh, a pilot and flight instructor who loves the sky, sharing it with those around me and using it to see the world from a new perspective. Flying can seem super complex, but I make it my mission to promote safe practices while enjoying the beauty this world has to offer. Subscribe to Climb Into the Cockpit on future adventures. This is Aviation 101. those of you who follow the channel pretty consistently, it's probably obvious to you that I have not posted videos super consistently as of lately. Lots of little things changing and moving around and it just has kind of become something that's really hard to keep up with. I'm talking about the YouTube videos here. Now, rest assured, nothing's gonna happen to the videos, nothing's gonna happen to the channel, everything's gonna keep going just as soon as I can get my footing in some things. I don't know, judging by negative threads out there, it might be some people's worst nightmare for this channel to exist in perpetuity. But the positive feedback that I get on the videos that I post, when I can post them, posts on Instagram and whatnot, so, so, so appreciated. I always love hearing the feedback. I love putting out something that all of you in the audience are enjoying here on YouTube. Living sort of a nomadic lifestyle with constant travel, constant plans changing and stuff like that has done some good things for my work ethic. It has shown me how to whittle down my setup, get rid of the things that I don't need, get rid of the processes that I don't need. And I feel like I have really honed that in, in terms of my video production process. That being said, on the post-production side of things, I am certainly still a one-man band. From data management to editing, everything in post-production, writing, voiceovers, etc., all the way to publishing on social media, scheduling the posts, I do all of it. For the last four and a half months, Chelsea and I lived in Galveston, Texas, down on the coast. We were just renting a little house down there, basically just as a kind of an interim place to live. We had some potential plans to go to Alaska this summer. We're not sure if that's gonna come together. Now we both have another job opportunity on the table that we might take, which will kind of disrupt our summer and fall. We're just kind of in limbo. So in the meantime, we needed a place to just be and work, and that was Galveston, Texas from January through the end of April, 2023. On April 30th, almost a month ago, we packed up all of our stuff and left our place in Galveston. Chelsea moved her Cessna 150 over here and we've just been kind of hanging out in the Austin area of Texas, mainly so that we can knock out some training. I finally finished my multi-engine commercial add-on. Did it in a Turbo Seneca 3 with Marty Fass and MEI over here at Blackhound Aviation at San Marcos. We were actually flying in my buddy Miles' Seneca. Don't think this airplane has been on camera before, but we took that big trip in his Cherokee 180. I called it the American Highway West series. We went out to Sedona, Utah, Idaho. Well, he has since stepped up a couple times in airplanes and now he has a Turbo Seneca 3. And that's what I ended up just getting my multi-engine rating in. My multi-engine check ride was actually divided into two days. The first day we started the oral, this is like the day of the check ride. The examiner goes over all the paperwork, makes sure I'm eligible, the plane is airworthy, etc. And then we start the ground portion. He quizzes me on some things, tests my knowledge, kind of asks me some scenario-based questions to see where my head's at. So the ground portion was actually really straightforward. We began with a worksheet. The examiner slid a worksheet over to me that had three parts. The first exercise was all about weight and balance. Hey, this company has hired you. They own the airplane. They need you to fly this airplane and transport as many boxes that weigh X amount to this airport. Here's your weather along the route. Usually it's IFR. Tell me how many boxes you can carry in this airplane while keeping it inside the envelope. Only considering legal fuel, none of the personal minimum stuff, just what's legal. I did use four flight weight and balance for that and kind of shuffled everything around and got it situated there. The second exercise was all about V-speeds. I wrote down all the V-speeds for the airplane. I had to reference the POH to remember a couple of them and we discussed every single airspeed. What is the definition of this airspeed? Is it marked on the airspeed indicator? At today's weight and center of gravity and density, altitude, etc. how is this speed affected? Does it go up or does it go down in actuality? And of course the center focus of that being VMC in a multi-engine airplane. We talk about the VMC airspeed. And then the final exercise was just a bunch of performance stuff, going through what we call the spaghetti charts in the POH. All the performance charts where you 
grab the outside air temperature and meet it with the pressure altitude and go over to the gross weight for today and then slide down and take off roll, etc. He gave me an airport and said, we're departing out of this airport and it's zero, zero. Crappy visibility, crappy ceilings. Can we make the required climb gradient to clear obstacles at this airport with one engine? So it's good. And then we, we just talked about some systems. What about the gear system on this airplane, on the Seneca? It's hydraulic electric, like many Pipers. Talked about some failure modes. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if your lights look like this when the gear come down? What about if they look like this? Talked about some troubleshooting stuff, POH stuff. And really after about an hour and a half of just kind of going back and forth and chatting, we were done. And we basically just waited for weather. Now, anything in the commercial airman certification standards is fair game on this check ride. But because I already did an initial commercial check ride back in 2015 or 2016, whenever that was, I've already got that knowledge. And that's really what the exam, the examiner wants to, to test out and see where my knowledge is there. Weight and balance is important in a multi-engine airplane, but they're not gonna dive into the fundamentals of how weight and balance works. I've already passed the commercial initial check ride. I should already know how that works. All of that kind of surface level aeronautical knowledge for a commercial pilot, we didn't really cover much of that because I've already taken the initial commercial check ride in a single engine. So this was just an add-on. This was applying the commercial pilot aeronautical knowledge to an airplane that now has multiple engines and more complex systems a more complex weight and balance envelope. And being more complex, it inherently has more risk factors to consider. And we just talked about all that stuff. That was a bulk of what the oral was about. So I have the track log for the check ride here on ForeFlight. It's stored on my iPad. I used the iPad the entire time on the check ride. I pretty much was able to figure out where everything was. The only thing I, we did an engine shutdown at some point on the flight. I can't remember exactly where it was. The check ride happened pretty fast. I mean, we were like, boom, boom, boom. One maneuver to the other, one procedure to the other. It was a day very much like today. I know the camera can't see the sky, but it's just sort of scattered cumulus and warm light wind. Right now it's out of the north. I think that day it was out of the southeast. We used runway 13. I was very meticulous about going through my checklist. I have the entire checklist for the Seneca on my iPad right here, including emergency procedures. It's very important with a checklist. You wanna make sure that it is exactly matching the operating handbook for this airplane. So even though you download one, cross check it and edit it to make sure that it is covering everything in the POH and then some if you prefer. So we're at the foot of the runway and first up is a normal takeoff. I asked the examiner, what kind of takeoff would you like? So I said, okay. So I went through the checklist and flaps are up, everything's set, good to go. So at 34 minutes past the hour is a normal takeoff. We're climbing out and then at 38 minutes past the hour is really our first maneuver. Our speed comes down and our altitude levels off and momentarily dips. Hmm, what do you think we did there? Right there was a power on stall in a climbing turn. So I already had the power up a little bit above 65%, which is what the ACS requires. And we were in a turn and the examiner said, okay, just go ahead, hold this turn and keep pulling the nose up for me and take it all the way to a power on stall. Done this a million times, including in a turn. The examiner has the right to ask you to do a stall in a turn up to a 20 degree bank. So I held about 20 degrees. I just kept pulling up, 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 up until the first indication of a stall. I can't remember if it was the buffet or the horn first. And then I just let the nose down, brought the power up to 40 inches on the manifold, turbocharged Seneca and recovered. So we did a couple of clearing turns there, just made one big S. And at 42 minutes past the hour, we began a steep turn. So I had ourselves established at about 120, 125 knots. I can't remember. And I first just rolled it into a right steep turn, 50 degrees of bank did all the way around 360 degrees. And as soon as we rolled back out, I immediately rolled into the left turn and started the turn to the left. So that's what happened right there at 42 minutes past the hour, 44 minutes past the hour right here. We continued this left-hand turn. And in this left turn, he said, okay, go ahead and hold 20 degrees of left bank, hold that bank and get into slow flight for me, which was kind of interesting. I don't think I had ever entered slow flight in a bank, but that's exactly what he asked me to do. I kind of struggled holding that bank in there because I, I just didn't like the feeling of it getting slow, but I kept it coordinated and got this airplane actually well below stall speed. You can get a twin well below its published stall speed in slow flight because the props are generating an accelerated slipstream over the wings. It's forcing air artificially over the wings and creating lift that way. So we were, I think, 15 knots below published stall speed before I actually finally got a stall indication. And the next maneuver was 46 minutes past the hour. So right in here, we got onto the straightaway. And as soon as we got onto the straightaway, that's when the examiner said, okay, just in this configuration, do whatever you got to do to get your appropriate speeds and show me a power off stall. So I basically just let the nose relax, got it above published stall speed, power to idle. And then I just started to pull the nose up and he wanted me to take that one to the full break. So I brought it, here's the buffet, here's the horn and the nose dropped. So then I relaxed the back pressure, brought the power up to 40 inches and 
cleaned up the airplane at that point. Now, I, it's hard to tell because we just didn't do too many maneuvers and I'm just kind of judging by the speed and altitude. I got a little bit squirrely here and let my altitude slip, but I believe it was in the next five minutes that we did the engine shutdown. I know we did the engine shutdown somewhere in here. It was before we, we actually executed the emergency descent. So up at altitude here, the, the examiner pulled up a, I don't remember if it was a checklist or his piece of paper, but he stuck it between the prop controls and the mixtures and he grabbed one mixture, so I can't see which one, and he pulled it all the way back. He killed that engine. I felt the yawing motion, felt an engine surge, so I controlled, pitched for blue line, cram all the engine controls forward, clean up the airplane, identify dead foot, dead engine, verify with the throttle, and I feathered the engine. That all happened within like eight seconds, from engine surge to me pulling the prop control all the way to the feather position. That happened about 45 minutes past the hour. We are like 12 minutes into the check ride, and we've already knocked out several maneuvers. As soon as the engine was shut down and I was able to go through the appropriate checklist, we were ready to start the engine back up. Start the engine, I think it took me three cranks to get it started. The checklist calls for the low boost pump to be on. These are Continental TSIO 360s, and in, on this airplane at least, I don't know about the rest of them, but it really doesn't need the boost pump on. So I actually ended up, after the first try, going against the checklist, and I turned off the boost pump and actually leaned the mixture a little bit and it fired right up. So once we got that engine fired up and good to go again, he said, okay, you need to get from 4,500 down to 3,500 as fast as you can. Show me how you do that. He's asking for an emergency descent. 49 minutes past the hour, we're 15 minutes into the flight. So I immediately dropped the nose, heel over to a 45 degree bank. At the same time, the throttles came all the way to idle, mixture props all the way forward, props full forward for maximum drag. And as long as we're below 130, the gear is coming down. I pitch for 120 knots, we do about 4,000 feet per minute on the indicator. And coming down to 3,500, I just start to arrest the steep descent, get below 108 knots, retract the gear, and start to add that power recover right on altitude. That's actually where this big tank and altitude is here. So we just kind of kept moseying down and the examiner momentarily took the controls, said, I have the flight controls, go ahead and put your foggles on. So I put the hood on so I could not see out the windshield. And now at 53 minutes past the hour, I am being vectored now for the RNAV 18 into Lockhart, Texas. So the whole purpose of this on a multi-engine commercial instrument add-on, because I'm instrument rated, I have to demonstrate instrument proficiency in a multi-engine airplane in a one-engine inoperative scenario. Right as I get my final vector and clearance to turn inbound for the approach, he pulls an engine back on the throttle. We don't actually fail an engine, but he pulls the throttle to idle. So I run through my drill. Control, blue line, cram, clean, identify, verify, feather. At which point I am now doing a simulated single engine instrument approach. I get vectored for final, I turn inbound. I got a little squirrely on the approach and the one time that I actually thought I might not pass this check ride was at the very tail end of the approach, probably 200 feet above decision altitude. It was an LPV approach. I got about three quarter deflection above the glide slope or above the glide path. And I mean, I had to really bring that good throttle back and put the nose down and I saved it just at the last second, got the power back in there and leveled off right on the glide path. And then just a couple seconds later, I hit decision altitude, I declared minimums and he said, go visual. I took the hood off and I did a single engine landing. Coming all the way back to the runway is then a short field takeoff. Maximum effort takeoff is what it's called in the POH with 25 degrees of flaps. Get as close to the edge of the runway as we can. Don't leave any good pavement behind us. Hold the brakes 40 inches, accelerate to about 64 knots indicated. Rotate, climb out at 66, which is VMC. It's a really vulnerable position in a twin, but you're only doing it for a couple seconds. That takeoff was six minutes past the hour. 17.06 local time. On around for left traffic and now he wants to see a short field landing. To achieve maximum braking, you are supposed to retract the flaps in most airplanes. Retracting the flaps sort of dumps some of that extra lift, gets more weight on the landing gear so that your tires don't start to kind of skid as you're slowing down and you're trying to get on the brakes. This is why it pays to know your POH. The POH mentions that to achieve maximum braking, retract the flaps on touchdown as you apply the brakes. But if maximum braking is not necessary, avoid retracting the flaps while you're still moving so that you don't just accidentally confuse retracting the gear for some reason and something bad can happen. So I asked him, would you like me to just simulate maximum braking? And he said, well, this is a check ride. So I want to see a no joke, short field landing. Do I want you to simulate anything? No, I want you to do it. So we come around the traffic pattern. Three minutes after takeoff, we are executing our short field landing. For the commercial pilot standard, you must touch down on or no more than 100 feet beyond your declared touchdown point. I declared my touchdown point the end of the runway. For reference, the thousand foot markers on a runway are 150 feet long. So we came right in for our short field landing. I put it right on the piano keys of the runway. I was super happy about that. He was super happy about that. And it was actually 
a buttery smooth landing. Now, that part was luck. That was not skill, that was luck. I'm not fooling anybody, the examiner knows good and well that that was luck as well. I retracted the flaps, got heavily onto the brakes, and we made the first taxiway off the runway, which was awesome. Now, 12 minutes after the hour, 17, 12 local time, we land, we taxi off the runway, and we come back to the threshold, and he says, okay, just give me a normal takeoff, and we'll, uh, we'll mosey our way back to San Marcos. We'll do one more maneuver on the way. This is just going to be a normal, everyday takeoff with both engines good, everything's good. So I roll onto the runway, start adding power. We probably got about 20 knots of speed and the airplane starts yawing heavily to the right. So I aborted the takeoff. He was simulating an engine failure on the takeoff by pushing one of the brakes on his side. As soon as I recognized directional control starting to get away from me, chop the power to idle, maintain directional control, get on the brakes. He said, okay, good. You got both engines, let's go. On the upwind, I don't remember what he said to me, but he got me to look over my left shoulder, look away from what he was doing. And he reached under my hands and he pulled back the right engine. He pulled it back to idle. So we're climbing out from the runway and the right engine fails. Airplane yaws toward the dead engine. So I said, ah, control, blue line, cram, clean the airplane up, identify, verify, feather. He said, so if you're gonna come back around and land at Lockhart, which way would you turn? It's left traffic at this airport. I said, well, I would turn to the right. I would make right traffic for the runway. And he said, okay. Why? We have a lot less energy now. We have a lot of added drag from that dead engine out there. I want to gently turn into the dead engine because that good engine will help us turn around. Whereas we're tur if we're turning into the good engine and raising that dead engine, we're gonna have to use a lot of rudder and a lot of aileron to kind of milk it against that good engine all the way around for left track. It's gonna be a lot more draggy and we're gonna have a lot less performance turning into the good engine as opposed to turning into the bad engine. He said, cool, sounds great. And he gave me the engine back. Now we have two engines, we climbed on out and we sort of circled above the town of Lockhart. We made our way up to about 4,000 feet. The Airman Certification Standards call for a VMC demo to happen no lower than 3,000 AGL. The POH for the Piper Seneca 3 declares that you should not do this any lower than 3,500 AGL. So I called that out to the examiner and I said, hey, we need to get up to at least 4,000 feet MSL. Elevation's about 500 out here. Marty and I have been practicing the VMC demo with failing the left engine because on a conventional twin, you would normally fail the left engine because that one is the critical engine because both props are spinning the same direction. A whole bunch of multi-engine aerodynamic concepts go into that. On this airplane, they're counter-rotating. So the forces acting on the airplane from both engines and both propellers are symmetrical. So he said, which engine do y'all normally fail on the VMC demo in training? I said, well, we've been failing the left one. Does this airplane have counter-rotating propellers? I said, yeah, it does. He said, fail the right one, which I had never done before, but no big deal. It's just, I'm gonna be pushing the opposite rudder pedal. I got down to about 90 knots rolled the right engine to idle, brought the left engine, the good engine, up to 40 inches, maximum power. And I started depleting the airspeed with pitch by about one knot per second. And I just kept going until I lose directional control. Now he artificially blocked my rudder verbally. And as I started to add some rudder, he said, okay, no more rudder. So I just stopped my foot, kind of planted my heel into the floor there and just held the rudder right there as the nose continued to come up. I was losing directional control when I saw the nose just slightly start to slide across the horizon. I declared that, I dropped the nose, brought the good engine down to idle to take away the asymmetrical thrust. Gain some airspeed, reintroduce that throttle back up to 40 inches, pitch for blue line, that's the end of maneuver. That was 17 minutes past the hour. So on the left downwind, I'm, I'm a beam, I'm looking out, I'm doing my gumps check, gas undercarriage, mixture prop, power, straps, flaps, switches. And when I get to the flaps, I notice that Roger, the DPE, has his left leg kind of like up on the Johnson bar. Either he is making himself comfortable in the cabin here, or he is simulating my flaps are inoperative. And I kind of looked at his foot and looked at him and I said, I assume the flaps are not working. He said, yep, the locking mechanism for the flaps is broken. You can't get him to stay down. I said, okay, no flap landing, no problem. And I actually don't think Marty and I did a no flap landing in this airplane, but it's no big deal. I just carried an extra five knots we're gonna burn up just a little extra runway. Put it down in the first 500 feet of the runway and rolled out, taxied off. So there were two items that he debriefed me on taxiing in. He said overall, he thinks the check ride went really well. He said there was never a point where he felt like I was struggling with, with keeping up with the airplane or keeping up with the systems or anything like that. He said I, he felt I was pretty on top of it. When I told Tower I was ready for takeoff, they gave us a takeoff clearance and said no delay because there was a Skyhawk on short final. This is a check ride. I wanna make sure I'm not gonna miss anything. So I almost took the takeoff clearance and I told Tower, I said, ah, eh, four hotel Papa, I'd like to just hold short. We're gonna need a short delay. So they said, no problem. Cancel takeoff clearance. Call when you're ready. Here, didn't screw us up all that much. But if you're at a big airport in a jet, they get a gap and clear you for takeoff. And then you say, oh, never mind. You, you're gonna screw up some flows and you might piss off an air traffic controller. When you say you're ready, you better be ready. On my engine shutdown, securing the engine, before I pulled that prop control on the bad engine back to feather it, I just took an extra second to glance 
and make damn sure I had the correct prop control in my hand. Feathering the good engine would be a really silly way to one, fail a check ride, and two, have an emergency landing. We would become a glider at that point. Under no circumstances should a twin lose both engines like that. We make an exception for Sully. He said, man, we're in a Seneca, so this thing's climbing no problem, right? But if you were in a Seminole, time is of the essence. We would be sinking. It does not have the horsepower to hold itself on one engine. So you have got to feather that bad engine as fast as possible. Time is of the essence. Run through your flow. You already verified it with the throttle. Feather the thing. It's 1.2 hours on the Hobbs for the check ride. I really enjoyed learning in the Seneca. I really enjoyed flying with Marty at Blackhound Aviation. And now I have a multi-engine rating added to my commercial pilot certificate with instrument privileges. So that feels pretty good. I've always wanted to learn how to fly twins. I would really love to own a twin someday. Might pick up a contract gig, maybe fly King Airs or something like that as time permits for me. So I figured I would kind of update you guys on what's going on in my life, kind of how things have progressed, why videos have been coming out super slow. I, I have just been trying to juggle everything and sort of figure out priorities and whatnot. So it's been really difficult on that front, but hopefully some consistency will be coming soon and that will bring consistency to the Aviation 101 YouTube channel and everything else. I love making this content. I love all of you guys. Thank you so much for being patient with the content. I'm back here trying to chase some goals, knock some things off my to-do list, including check rides. And now Chelsea is next for the multi-engine commercial check ride as soon as we get back from this next two week trip. Please share your check ride experiences, your training experiences. I wanna hear about some cool stories you have from check rides or maybe something unexpected on a check ride, something like that. Leave those comments down below. Definitely hit like on this video if you did subscribe, if you haven't and turn on those notifications so you don't miss the next video that comes out whenever that may be. And until next time, you know the drill. I want you to stay happy, healthy, current, but most importantly, stay proficient. Go fly with a buddy, challenge each other, chase that next rating, certificate, or endorsement. Constantly build your skills and portfolio. Never stop learning. And we'll see you in the next video. Fly safe.